The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual co-hosts and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Save the Second or their employers. This show offers commentary on the latest news associated with the NRA and Save the Second's endeavor to promote a strong, relevant, and effective, and particularly accountable NRA. Welcome to the Save the Second podcast, episode four. Today is Sunday, September 15th, 2019. In this episode, we will be discussing the after action of the NRA Board of Directors meeting, which happened yesterday, September 14th. Joining us on today's show are Anthony Garcia. Rob Pincus will be joining us later, uh, hopefully with Andy Lander as well. My name is Ron Carter. I'd like to welcome you all to the show. You know what? Let's just jump right into it, Mr. Garcia. Now, Mr. Garcia, you were not able to join us in Virginia. So I'm curious, looking from the outside, what are your thoughts? My thought generally is that they were extremely unwelcoming to the members that came to see what was going on. And they uh, did exactly what we believe they were going to. They went uh, immediately into executive sessions, almost immediately, um, into executive sessions, kicked you guys out. It's kind of what we thought they were going to do. And uh, it really just a lot of um, uh, a lot of platitudes, a lot of nonsense, and uh, nothing has changed. That's kind of how I see it from the outside. Yeah, so uh, Mr. Pincus is with us now. Uh, so Rob, tell me, what do you think? Uh, were, were you welcomed? Were, were, was the NRA welcoming to, to members who wanted to, uh, to attend? Well, no. Uh, you know, it was amazing. It was, and it's one thing to not be welcomed, right? And, and one could say, okay, so we're obviously doing a lot of things that are antagonistic to the current leadership. Uh, there's people there that I've been friends with for 20 years, people there that I maybe was uh, industry acquaintances with for a while, and then uh, now are, are rather you know upset by the way that we, and, and particularly the, that I am approaching this because of our relationship, and maybe they didn't expect to see someone who was pro-Second Amendment turn against the leadership of the NRA. So I almost give them a pass for, yeah, they give me a hard time, or, or you know they made it a little bit difficult or whatever. The problem is, there was absolutely no preparation for any member to show up, let alone me, let alone us, even though a lot of people that were on the board knew we were coming. And we certainly publicly, uh, we know that they're watching our Facebook page or watching our, our social media. And, and we said that we were going to be there. We even had a Facebook event created to be there. And yet there was no preparation whatsoever for members to be there. They had a, a protocol for it. But for example, the first day, there was no place to sit. If, if 10 members had shown up, they would have had to have expanded the room or found more chairs or squeezed people in or something like that. The second day, there were four or five seats with the with printed out, you know, recently printed out pieces of paper laying on them that said members. Uh, obviously, security sat right next to us. Security would not let us talk to the directors. Uh, obviously, parliamentary procedure includes the opportunity for anybody who's attending a meeting to approach the chair, uh, the chairperson and say, hey, I'd like to speak. I'd like to address the the attendees uh, and, and particularly the committees. And yet we were not allowed uh, under the rules of security. Now, certainly I could have said, you know, tackle me and go on and run up to the, the chairperson. But I kind of feel like that's almost what they were waiting for. You know, they were waiting for one of us to stand on a chair. They were waiting for one of us to go where we weren't supposed to go, waiting for us to do something wrong just so they could say, see, that's why we don't want members there. Um, so no, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't feel welcome uh, by the organization at all. Uh, and I don't think they were really ready for members to be there, nor did they want members there at all. That being said, obviously there were a lot of, as I think you experienced, Ron, there were a lot of uh, individual directors who were very glad we were there and were very welcoming and were, were uh, actually, it was, it was a great relief to find out that more than I thought were happy we were there and were ready to have discussions with us. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Director Linda Walker actually said that verbatim that she was very happy that I was there. And unfortunately, she was kind of few and far between. Granted, there we, we had the opportunity to talk with several directors outside of, you know, the, the meetings and, and whatnot uh, on the Friday night at the the uh, the social hour that we had. But you're absolutely right. Uh, it, I walked in on Friday just after noon. And immediately when you walked in the hotel, there were signs for, uh, what was it, some sort of swing dancing. Uh, there was a, some sort of medical convention going on. Signs pointing at where these these places were uh, or these events were being held. There was absolutely no signs whatsoever 
about the NRA. Uh, so you just had to wander around until you found something. And, and when you found something, there wasn't anything to, to suggest what you were attending or, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there was no itinerary to be, to be had. Uh, I'm not sure exactly who would, would have been the, the method of contacting. I asked the, uh, the security person, I'm like, Hey, so what, what committees are meeting? And they're like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay. You don't know. So who can I ask? And, uh, now, I called previously, I called the office of the secretary earlier in the week just to confirm that the meeting was being held at this particular location. And they confirmed that at least, but they didn't have any other information on that. It was so weird. Now, we were joined by several other members. Uh, so quick shout outs to David, Michael, Ken, Frank. Uh, I think there were a few more, but we, we had some other members join us. Uh, what, what do you think on that, Rob? Was that a, I mean, that was kind of inspiring, right? It was great. I mean, we had a lot of people show up for our gathering Friday night. You know, we knew that that more people would be there at what was, you know, it was really it was gratifying to hear so many of the people that were there say the only reason really they knew about it or the reason they showed up was because of uh, the work of Save the Second and the posts that we made and the invitations we made in Friday night. The best part for me on Friday night was when we sort of broke out of our own little, you know, group. And especially not not just as much the three of us, because we're obviously active and and, you know, sort of have that that uh, scarlet letter on us as the, the guys that are really pushing this issue. But the the everyday members who have nothing to do with Save the Second, nothing to do with the NRA, nothing to do with the industry other than being American gun owners and being NRA members. The fact that they got up and, you know, walked up uh, pretty boldly in some cases, not confrontationally, but I mean, it takes a certain amount of, of intestinal fortitude and, and conviction that you're doing something that's OK, you're doing the right thing to walk up to a board member. Some of these these people who have been on the board 20, 30 years, some of these people are heroes to, uh, you know, or like celebrities, at least industry, community celebrities to some of the attendees, uh, the members. And they walked right up, you know, they then all the board members are wearing their little yellow pin and sure they're over there having a drink with their friends they're over here having dinner they're over here having a snack and we were kind of doing the same thing in our corner and it was really important that they got out and shook the hands of the directors and that's why i think it's so important that we get more and more engagement from the members with the directors at events like this and not just the board meeting where again security's all over us and we have to stay in our little you know kids section so to speak the peanut gallery but uh at the social events and at the hotel throughout that whole week uh coming up in january you know it was really uh encouraging to me uh when i believe it was mr michael that was sitting with us he had joined us uh you know there uh, uh friday evening and you had made mention you're like yeah there's there's several directors uh, sitting around there and he, he turned around and looked and immediately got up out of his chair and went and tried to find the 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 nearest uh board member board of director who wasn't uh, engaged in a conversation and introduced himself and you know carried on a, a very interesting conversation yeah, that that happened all throughout the night of course now for those of you who weren't aware uh us at save the second there were three of us that were able to attend myself rob pinkus and now andy lander who is joining us now Andy, how welcome were you at the board meeting? Well, first of all, I want to apologize to everybody. I was mowing the yard and I lost track of time and I had things to do. And uh, so, you know, honey do list. So I, I got on a little late. So I apologize to everybody. Uh, I, I was, uh, it, it was interesting. I, I saw a lot of individuals that I, I had worked with. Um, and that welcomed me. Uh, a lot of fr friends that I'd seen, uh, individuals that actually, when I when I left NRA, actually cried and uh, came up, gave me a big hug. They were lawyers, and um, it was ha I was happy to see them. I had great conversations with a lot of my former friends, and and some of these friends are deeply involved in what's going on. Uh, and also, I had individuals that uh, that I worked with, uh, you know, directors that I worked with that uh, I said hello to and that uh, uh, wouldn't even look at me. Um, so it was interesting to see. It was very, it was very interesting. It was, they kind of looked at, at us as the, um, I guess, as the enemy. Uh, when, when I, you know, I, I shared my concern with a lot of them of why I was doing this, and I, and I told them, you know, I'm 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 deeply concerned about the association and. Uh, and I want to see it get better. Um, but I, I can tell you, uh, you know, there was that meeting, the board meeting where Wayne got up and said, uh, break down the silos. And, you know, the morale has never been higher at NRA. I heard that silo speech many times when I worked there. I mean, almost probably once a year for 10 years. And it's the same speech. And I remember when I first heard it, it got worse. 
And so, and then he said, morale's never been higher. Um, that's not what I saw. So, uh, you know, just from seeing people that I worked with and seeing people, you know, just coming up to people, I could kind of see it in their eyes. You know, they, they didn't really have to say anything. And I still talk to people at the association uh, that work there. And uh, I can tell you that um, I don't know where he's getting that information. I, I think that uh, the individuals that uh, are on the board are very out of touch with what happens. I mean, I, I approached one board member and, and said, you know, did you know that well, actually it was more than one. I approached them and said, did you know Josh Powell fired an entire division? And both of them looked at me and said, no. I said, well, that happened about 2017. Here are they. Who, here's it. Well, you know, they, they went in this tirade. And I said, well, yeah, but you didn't know that. So the board is, is, is very out of touch with what goes on there. Uh, there was information that came out in the board meeting from, from Wayne about how all board members now have to go through the secretary's office before they contact an employee. Uh, I also understand that the uh, NRA general operations has been consolidated into one division under Joe DeBurgelis. Uh, so that's, again, that's another big control of information of, of what's going where. So I didn't see that. I didn't see what they were saying was to be true. I mean, I, I could see it in, in, in their eyes and I could, when I talked to them, I just got this feeling that no, not everything is okay. And people are worried. Yeah. So I have so many mixed emotions about, you know, the, this being in, in the board meeting and, and conversations outside the board meeting, of course, Andy, you're speaking as a former employee and someone who is still a member and very, very concerned about your NRA, uh, yeah, me as a member, I'm very concerned as well. And well, like for for example, you know, I, I mean, I got the feeling, and I talked to quite a, to some of the few that were in the old guard and that, that really went after Chris Cox and talked how poorly about Chris Cox and really attacked him and things like that. It was funny. I was talking to, uh, uh, I want to say it was um, Todd Rathner, and I was talking to him, and he was saying, "Oh, you know, Chris Cox, and you know, he he's a problem." and that he, he orchestrated a lot of this stuff. And, and from what I understand, it was a year ago that, that he was singing Chris Cox's praises, but he was saying how all the staff members did not like Chris and how they hated him. And, and, I, and after about listening for five minutes, I said, that's interesting because my, wor my wife worked for him. My wife loved him. And I came home and I told her that last night and she looked at me like, what are you talking about? I said, yeah, apparently you hate him. <laughs> so, you know, and... Um, so the board is very out of touch with just what is going on um, in the program side, in the in the in, at the actual worker B side. So I got I, I got some information just subconsciously that I thought was very interesting. So during the meeting, uh, and of course, if you want to see sort of like a a firsthand uh, written shorthand, I guess you would call it, of uh, the, the meeting minutes. I, I somewhat put that up on our blog post. You can check that out at savethe2a.org uh, under blogs. Uh, one of the things that we saw, and Anthony, I want your opinion on this, absolutely. Uh, very interesting. It seems that Wayne LaPierre has created a, or rather started, I'm not sure if he created or whatnot, but it's being called a war room and a rapid response team that will essentially be able to put out media perhaps comment on, on social media posts and whatnot concerning current events. And along with that comes uh, the ability for them to make videos very quickly. And we saw three clips, three 60 second videos uh, there. And it was kind of interesting that they show those during open session, right? Not executive session and explain that process. But anyway, one of the things that, that it seems will be repeated often now is going to be a kernel of truth surrounded by a bushel of lies. A kernel of truth surrounded by a bushel of lies. And this is apparently in regards to some of the ongoing he said, she said uh, infighting that has manifested itself into uh, lawsuits against Oliver North, Chris Cox stepping down, and more. So, Anthony, with all of that information, what are your thoughts? Um, well, first of all, the idea of like a, uh, a rapid response team of some sort that can make videos and stuff like that, a great idea, I actually think, and making all that stuff in house, great idea, um, because it keeps all that, it's um, much more efficient, um, and it's much um, 
much more cost efficient, time efficient um, all the way around. Uh, so my question is, why haven't they been doing that this whole time? And oh yeah, it's because they were blowing tons of money on Ackerman Queen to do it. Um, they should have been doing it this entire time in order to properly in-house, run. But it's, the, not, um, it's not in-house. Huh? What did you say? I said it might be in-house, but it appears it's a lot of outsiders that are coming to the, you know, coming to the building that are doing it. Okay. Yeah, strange times, okay. but but still, let, let's let's assume just just for you know the sake of patting you know good projects and whatnot on the back that that it's in house, right? I mean that that that's yeah, uh, yeah wise. It's it's still not a bad idea. I I don't have any problem with that. Um, what's interesting though is the phrase "a kernel of truth surrounded by a bushel of lies." Yeah, I agree, but I have a feeling that my idea of that kernel of truth and bushel of lies is probably a little bit different than theirs. Um, and that's really all I got on it. The, the 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 initial premise is it's a good one, I think. It's a good change. I just really want to know what the truth is and perhaps what the yeah. lies are. And it, that's that's know. the question. I think everybody's truth and everybody's lies are a little bit different. I I, I am looking forward to how they deploy that particular statement. Yeah, absolutely. Well, they never told us what the kernel of truth was either. <laughs> so Right. Uh yeah. Um so why was Save the Second there? One of the things, one of the goals that we had going into this particular meeting was to see our bylaw amendment petition through. Now we knew that they would probably do some sort of uh, lackadaisical uh, bylaw <laughs> reading, I suppose you would say, and trying to follow the bylaws to their their advantage. And you know, thankfully, after uh, the meeting had come out of executive session, it went into executive session uh, around 10 a.m. and came back into open session around one o'clock. Uh, we were able to hear from apparently now uh, the chairman of the bylaws committee. What's her name? Uh, I just had it here. Sandra. Uh, is it Sandy Foreman? Sandy Froman. Froman. Thank you. Uh, she, I believe it's her. I'll, I'll have to double check. Maybe I've got that wrong. Uh but regardless, she made a comment to this uh, amendment, or I'm sorry, rather the the attendance amendment that we have proposed. And she says that they're going to defer that for further discussion to discuss its merit. Rob, what do you think on that? Oh, you're muted. You're muted, Rob. Oh. Muted, Rob. Hi. Oh, he's back. Praise God, Amen. Says I'm not All muted. Right. Okay. So, so um, it it seems like you know I, I, we weren't expecting much. We know that, right? But I was expecting more than we got. And honestly, let's think about this. If we go word by word, explicitly what was said, the report from the committee to the board, which then means obviously the vote. So that any report, any discussion, any vote was deferred to a future meeting, so that the committee could research the merits of having board members attend the meetings. That's what was said. So I want to know who's on the committee. And of course, they have the, the little blue books. This year, they're blue. Um, they, they change the color of the directories for every year. And the directory this year is blue. I don't have one yet. It's like the most top secret document I think the IRA puts out. Uh, into the hands of the directors. I saw, I've seen a couple of them, but I haven't had a chance to leave through one or no one's, you know, obviously share the, the the wit rule and all the things they've got now with document retention and obviously they're concerned about leaks so it's probably going to have those but why is it so members of the organization to know are who the committee chairs are because obviously a lot of the business relies on knowing who these people are the influencers and who's actually able to take action all that have more time to research whether or not there are merits two board members attending the board meeting so basically we got told we don't care that hundreds of people signed nra voting members signed a petition we don't care that this is something that just makes obvious good practice sense for organization this off and we'll talk about it later because it would be embarrassing to have a vote that wouldn't pass something so self-evident and imagine if it did pass and the members make against the desires, wishes, interest of the leader. 
dictatorship. That's just something that they can't afford instances to show the strength of, of the members. They, and so they're not going to let that happen. They, they really can't afford the optics of saying, no, we don't think members of the attend meetings. So I think we really stuck them in a, in a awkward position and they tried to sneak out of it with one quick and we were there to hear it. And I'm glad we're, we're able to talk about it with the members to show just out of tune and uh, uh, these right now. So let's talk about the board of directors real fast. I counted and there was some discrepancy with what directors were present, but I counted 55 of the current 71 eligible directors in attendance. Uh, 55 of 71 is 77%. So uh, is that telling? Is, is that, I mean, obviously 77% is probably higher than what there has been in previous uh, board of directors meetings, but still 55 of 71. Anthony, what do you think? At one of the most important meetings in this organization's current, um, well, recent history, um, the fact that so few showed up, it's its very telling. Um, either, well, I guess it could be a couple of things. Either A, it's apathy, or B, they're trying to insulate themselves um, from any potential further legal issues. I don't know. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a mixture of the two. Uh, nonetheless, I'll tell you one thing it is for certain, and um, it's BS. That's... Well for certain. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, you know, of those directors who could have attended, why not attend? Right. I mean, it, right. granted, it, it's not a vacation. You're actually doing work, but you, the, the directors have their expenses, their travel expenses, you know, compensated, you know, to them and that that's in the bylaws. So yep. now a couple of notable absences was Oliver North, which I, I, I had hoped he would show up just to see kind of, you know, sparks fly and, you know, provide at least some sort of defense of himself since he seems to be something of a scapegoat times two. I, I don't know. Uh, there's so much I don't know. But one of the, the most disheartening absences was Alan West. Mr. Lander, what are what is your opinion on Alan West not being there? Um, well, to my understanding, Alan West was actually out of the country. So I'm going to look at this from both sides. I mean, probably, you know, for him to travel across seas and go to other countries, that was probably well planned in advance. I mean, this you got to remember, these committee meetings are planned well in advance as far as who's meeting. So, yeah, the location was a big deal. And so I, I don't know if I can fault him, but at the same time, this is a time of turmoil, and this is a time where where every board member needs to lead us. So at the same time, I, I, I am going to say that, yeah, I was a little disappointed in that, but I, but I can't understand. I mean, Oliver North, I can understand a little bit. I mean, he was out for a family reason. Um, also, with the current lawsuit, I mean, he would have been, uh, he would have been plutonium in that room. So, you know, I, I don't know, um, you know, again, I, I think at this, at this juncture, we, we need to have everybody there doing what we need them to do. Um, <clears throat> you know, some of the others that, that, that haven't been mentioned are individuals like Kim Rohde. You know, Kim Rohde is uh, somebody that's, um, she's kind of in that mushy middle where she is, oh, I'm a competitive shooter and that's all I want to do. Leave me alone and I'm just going to focus on this. I mean, yeah, she's involved in a lawsuit with NRA and the California stuff. But but look, again, this is just another example. And again, uh, Dean Kane, you know, Superman. I mean, if you're going to take this job, you need to take it seriously. I mean, this is uh, one thing I did. You know, I stood up when Cot when Charles Cotton gave a speech about standing on the wall of the Alamo. I mean, yeah. I mean, it wasn't because everyone else stood up. It was a stand up to say, look, if you're going to lead us, lead us. And that means you need to be here. So while I didn't really agree with Mr. Cotton on some of the stuff, I agree with what his statement was about, you know, if you're going to be on this wall, you need to stand to, uh, shoulder to shoulder. And there was, you know, over 10 or, or excuse me, there was a few people that weren't there. So it's very clear on who is, uh, you know, serious about this and who is just about, well, I'm on the board of directors and I'm just going to be on the board of directors, you know? So 
Yeah, it was so interesting to see those directors and how they interacted, not only with us, but with the others. Uh, it seems like, uh, say, Jay Prince, Jim Porter, uh, and several others, you know, were all in a tight group. They didn't really get out of that group. And, now, of course, I, I didn't see Willis Lee, uh, second vice president, first vice president, Charles Cotton, or the president, Carolyn Meadows, outside of the meeting. They were only in the meeting. In fact, uh, the president, Carolyn Meadows, uh, had, I, I suppose she was the chair, or at least had been the chair of the finance committee. She didn't even show up to, to the finance committee's committee meeting. Now, granted, that was, of course, uh, because and she gave the excuse that that she was uh, ill and she had something something wrong with her throat. I don't know. She was able to give her president's report, which was odd, very odd. Uh, Andy, I tell you what, why don't you give us a kind of an overview of what she said for her president's report? And then, Anthony, I'd like your thoughts. Well, Karen Lamento is one of the first things she said is she said, you know, I've been told I'm going to prison. And uh, then I go to prison. I like cho I think she said I like chocolate chip cookies, or maybe I don't like chocolate chip cookies. So, you know, I took that as twofold. As I uh, actually took that as maybe they're worried. Maybe they're worried. I, you know, um, it, and after that, it kind of turned into a, a Wayne has got us through everything, and we need to let Wayne lead us, and and it turned into very much a they almost looked at Wayne as a deity, you know, as far as, uh, as, uh, you know, and here's the thing I don't understand is, is if you're an organization and you have a, a, you know, you've got this, what happens right now? And I'm not, I'm not making a threat. God help me. I'm not making a threat. But what happens like right now if Wayne dropped dead from a heart attack, you know, what's the plan? Who's going to replace him? You know, I mean, come on, we got to have this, uh, in place. And, uh, and it just seems that they've put him on a pedestal and, and we saw this from, you know, we saw board members stand say, Wayne, are you, I, I don't remember who it was, but he stood his back and he looked at it, us or looked at him and said, Wayne, are you going to lead us through this? Are you going to be our warrior? And of course, everybody cheered. And, you know, we, I saw people in the back of the room stand up and hooting and hollering and things like that. And, and, and you know, to me, I, I go back to what Frank Tate said in Rob Pincus's interview. Uh, and I was, I really listened to that about organizations and, and we're at a point where organizations have just lost touch. They're, they're looking at it from a they're now so involved with themselves, they've lost us. I mean, Willis Lee, we were sitting right next to him quite a few times. The man wouldn't even look at us. I mean, every time the man turned around and, and glanced, he wouldn't even make eye contact. I mean, these are people that are supposed to be representing the members. I mean, I, granted, we're from an organization that they consider somebody the enemy, which I, I find crazy. But, you know, they won't even talk to us. I mean, me and Rob were the first night you weren't there, Ron. Uh, we were there in the restaurant. We watched. Uh, Ron Schmitz, and we watched some other individuals, uh, Jim Porter, and I can't remember who, but some some of the old guard executive committee walked in the room. And if I had a watch on and I had timed it, I want to say they stared at us for a good two to three minutes. You know, Dwayne Liptak from Magpul walked in. He was the first one that came up and sat down and talked to us and just kind of, you know, shook our hand and listened. And then, and then you know, Mark Geist uh, sat down at a table by himself, and I woke up, and or I walked up to him, and kind of said, sir, you know, I think he thought I was going to say, oh my gosh, you know, you're my hero. But I said, sir, we're over here with a couple board members. Why don't you come over here and have a conversation? And he came over about 15 minutes later, sat down with us and listened. Uh, Susan Howard, of all people, I was surprised, but believe me, I was surprised. Susan Howard, a Star Trek king, queen of the Klingons. She came over and talked. I, I don't really know if we talked about anything really kind of important on this issue, but she came and she listened. There were two other individuals that did. But, you know, I listened to that president's, um, that president's uh, speech, and all I heard was, you are out of touch. You are just out of touch with everybody. Uh, this is clearly about Wayne, about keeping him in power, about keeping y'all, you know, in the gravy train. And uh, there's no you, have no, you have no other interest in making a change or, or trying to make the organization better. Yeah, so go for it, Anthony. What, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I, I think the, that president's speech is, is interesting. Can you tell, can you say those lines again in her president's speech? 
Uh, so she had you talking about uh, where she made the quip about uh, her going to jail? Yeah, Can yeah. You was, say that again. It was totally Will. She she was uh, introducing you know her her report, which is it's odd. It, this was her president's report. It uh, is that's the standard thing though. That's not that's on that's everybody gives their own report. Okay, sure. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I get, it. I get it that they give a report, but you know, you mentioned or you listened to Joe DeBurgulis, and and he actually gave a more of a detailed. This is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. And Carolyn Meadows, President Carolyn Meadows, uh, started talking, and she said that someone had uh, told her that she would be going to jail. And there was a few laughs around the room, and she kind of, you know, laughed, ha ha ha, and said. Uh, if I go to jail, I don't like chocolate chip cookies. I think that's what she said. I don't like, I do like, I, I'm not sure, but I don't understand exactly why chocolate chip cookies are relevant to going to jail. I'm, I, I don't know. I've never been to jail, but I mean, do you receive cookies in jail? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, yeah. It just sounds like she's, she's massively out of touch with everything, anything. The fact that they did not, I mean, especially her as president of the board, the fact that she did not immediately dress, hey, members in the room, thanks for coming. Let's talk about the issues. That would have been my very first sentence. Hey, guys, thanks for coming. Let's talk. Very first sentence out of my mouth. Um, the, the fact that that did not immediately go there, but instead it went to prison and chocolate chip cookies, Again, I don't understand the reference, but okay. Um, the fact that it went there and not the issues at hand is probably one of the most telling things I I, I could possibly think to, to see. It's not only out of touch. That's not even quite the, quite the, the word. It is willfully ignoring the membership. It's willfully hostile to the membership that's showing up. It's not even out of touch. It's willfully hostile against it. Um, that's how I see it. Now we, we had a, a friend of ours who's in the chat right now with us, uh, David Cross uh, with us. He was in the meeting and he quotes uh, Carolyn Meadows as saying, quote, I'll put this on the screen for you. She says the NRA would be nothing without Wayne LaPierre. And David comments, that is not the way to build an organization. I absolutely Again, agree. it's, it's that um, it's that cult mentality again. No, nobody but LaPierre could do this. You're not even fit to hold his coat. It, it's the same cult mentality. You keep seeing this in, in different places. Now, granted, it's it's all it, it's all inside the old guard, but I mean, it just it just further underscores the point that the only real change in this organization is going to come from us. It's going to come from the members. I, I mean, I think that's that's my opinion. I'm with you. I don't mean to call. I don't mean to call anybody out, but there's also an individual in this chat um, that I can tell you right now has probably two to three times the amount of experience I have working with the association, and you can see that that individual is very frustrated um, at what's going on. So when you hear, and, and actually, um, you know, I know that that individual still has ties, um, but. Uh, <laughs> You know, when I hear the things about employees are happy and things like that, you know, it's it's just not true. And now, of course, um, we, we've so, all said it, you know, we'll, we'll say the second that one person does not make or break the NRA. So removing Wayne LaPierre, while we all agree that 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 needs to happen. Uh, yeah, that doesn't solve the problems. Right. We want to be able to solve the problems. And you mentioned, of course, Anthony, this this cult like mentality. I had a chance to speak with a few directors who, who disagree with us, who agree with Wayne LaPierre. They were very, uh, the few that I talked to that, that had, uh, that sort of difference with, with us. It was kind of interesting to see. Um, one is a, a gentleman, he, kind of elderly, but I respect immensely. I respect him very much. I don't want to call him out because, well, I, I do respect him. On the other hand, he, he has been fed a lot from the NRA, from the leadership. And so he's doing, I believe he's doing everything to, to the best of his abilities uh, to, to make the NRA as good as it can be. And he's trying to fulfill his duties, but he's, I think, accepting a lie that, that Wayne LaPierre is perfect. Uh, I, that, that's my observation 
and it's it's one that makes me think that we could potentially influence directors by saying, well, hey guys, listen, you're saying that you know uh, Ackerman McQueen and and Oliver North and and Alan West are all to blame, but even if they are to blame, Wayne LaPierre had this happen during his watch and did nothing to prevent it. So where's the responsibility? Where do you take responsibility? Where's that accountability? But one of the things that I heard a board member say, which I totally agree with on that topic is, as uh, uh, one of the board members we sat down with said, well, look what just happened with the SEAL teams. You know, you had the SEAL teams, there was something that had happened overseas and, and they basically cleaned house. And you can't, you can delegate uh, authority, but you can't delegate responsibility. So that's a big problem. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I agree with that statement. And I think that, uh, you know, you've, you know, Wayne's been at it for 41 years and I think, uh, his time is well past and there's, there's needs to be a torch past. So Rob, what's your impression first of, of the directors and this, this weird division between those who sing LaPierre's praises and those who don't? Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's it, we got to remember it's it's seventy six individuals. Uh, you know, about uh, forty something of them were there when I arrived on Thursday. Uh, we had close to sixty there by the time the board meeting uh, of Saturday morning, and so you got sixty different individuals and sixty different personalities. Now it's very clear that some of them are in lockstep. Some of them are repeating uh, things like the you know kernel of truth surrounded by a bushel of lies, uh, without again telling us what the truth is. I'll give you an example: Carrie Lightfoot. Carrie Lightfoot and I have been friends in the industry. Uh, she was there Thursday morning and I saw her in the hall and I said, hey, Carrie, she said, hey, Rob, how you doing? I said, hey, I really would like to talk to you about some of these issues. And she said that, no, she did not want to talk to me about these issues. And I said, really, that, that, is that kind of where we are? Is that how it's going to be? And she said, yeah, she thought that's kind of how it should be. I said, okay. So, you know, wanting to be I, I, I you know, wanting to be polite, I guess, to a, to a friend and, you know, uh, someone who I respect in the industry with what she's done with well-armed women and, and, and all that. I said, okay, well, you know, I was really hoping that that, that it would be different uh, being here. Now, this is one of the first conversations I've had with the director because the directors were in committee meetings when I arrived and I was told that I could not interrupt that meeting. And presumably it was already an executive session. So she said to me, you know, at the end of this, Rob, you're going to understand a lot more. At the end of this weekend, you're going to understand a lot more than you do now. And you'll realize what information you have been acting on that's wrong and, and what inf what the real information is. Okay, good. I'm looking forward to that. Thanks, Carrie. And we moved on. Or, you know, I went back to where I was. She was went on to wherever she was going. And that was not true. Now, maybe because she's a junior director, she's trying to get in with the regime. She's trying to get, you know, be... Uh, connected to the NRA, connected to the the people that are running the NRA, the old guard, as it were. So that's all pretty obvious, right? And she may have really believed. Maybe that's what they told her. Maybe they told her, oh, the members will understand by the end of the weekend. I don't think that's what, what happened. I think that that she was hoping that that would be the case, that maybe I was going to you know, be influenced by some directors or my experience there would let me know that everything's okay in the same way that, you know, what Marion Hammer's rants have been telling me that everything's okay, or Meadows' hypocritical, you know, self-contradicting uh, statements have been telling me everything's okay while the NRA is sending out crisis alerts telling us they need money. It just didn't pan out that way. So, you know, Kerry, unfortunately, represents um, that, that group of people on the board who I like, who I respect what they've done in the community, but I do not respect the way they're handling their position on the board. And uh, that's sort of the, the status quo right now, right? So, there are other individuals, um, Mark Geist, for example, who came over and spent a lot of time with us, who I had, had no interaction with, didn't know at all, didn't you necessarily even recognize kind of who's that guy when I first saw him and uh, was more interested, like, who's the guy with the dog, right? Because beautiful dog, Roan, was there uh, with him. But, um, you know, getting to know him, what a great guy. And, and I think sincerely interested in seeing what's going on. Uh, Mark Robinson, who we didn't talk to as much, but he was very much kind of on the sidelines in almost every way, um, kind of watching everything. I think that he's being very cautious about what quote unquote side he takes or what positions he takes on some of the issues. Um, other people who we know are, are aligned with an interest in change. Um, I think a lot of people are surprised by Ted Nugent, um, but I've been talking to him for months and I've known him for over two decades. So, so I 
had a lot of faith placed in him that he was going to show up and say the things he said he was going to say and do the things he said he was going to do. And he did. He was the one director that stood up on behalf of the members and objected to going to executive session. Dwayne Liptak obviously stepped up in a huge way. Just the fact that he sat down with Andy and I on uh, Thursday night, I think it was, meant meant the world to sort of us being normalized in that room, right? Because in the social hour, it was very easy for the directors to just stay in their cliques and kind of give me a nod if I knew them or come over and shake hands and say hi and move on. You know, but Dwayne sat down and, and you know, we shared a, a great conversation and then others started, he kind of normalized it. It almost made it like, well, how can you not acknowledge the fact that members are sitting here, right? Linda Walker came over and talked to us. Uh, Bob Brown, you know, Robert Brown has been uh, uh, very uh, active in pushing the regime, pushing the leadership and pushing for accountability and, and sort of rebuking Marion Hammer's uh, comments and, and Willis Lee's comments in, in the public space as if we're just to be dismissed, uh, the condescending actions that they've taken. So there really are a whole bunch of different personalities here. And then there's people that I clearly don't agree with the position they're taking. Charles Cotton had some great interactions with Charles Cotton outside of the formal environment of the meetings. We clearly are on completely opposite spectrums of, of whether the NRA is doing just fine and, and whether Wayne LaPierre should move on. But he's a good guy. And, and I really respect the directors who, who clearly disagree with me or with us that we're still able to, to share a beverage, shake a hand and, and talk about, you know, hey, how are things? How's the family? What's going on? Because at the end of the day, again, it's 76 people. And that's one thing people need to remember is you need to reach out to these individual directors as people. If you like Magpul products, let Dwayne know that in your introductory statement. I'm a member. I'm concerned about the NRA. By the way, love PMAGs. But let's talk about Wayne LaPierre, right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, I, I had similar uh meetings or, or uh, instances with, say, Anthony Calandro, uh, which, by the way, he's he said the same thing, uh, Rob, that Kerry Lightfoot said to you. And I think uh, Andy was there for that, too, uh, where he said that, you know, we would have all of our questions answered, at, you know, during the meeting or something like that. And I left the meeting with more questions than I arrived. So that was very strange. Apparently, they had meant, I'm, I'm speculating here, sorry. Uh, they went into executive session, so we don't know what was said during executive session. Uh, we do know, of course, like Ted Nugent, which, by the way, I apologize to Ted Nugent. I went up to him and said, I am happy to eat my words. I've been a big critic of, of yours, and I'm so happy that I was wrong. Uh, but but Ted Nugent, you know, he stepped up for us and, and tried to object to going into executive session. Well, apparently, uh, they did not mention it while we were able to be in the room, but the NRA has set up a new website called NRALegalFacts.org. Uh, Liptek, Dwayne Liptek had mentioned that in a statement. I shouldn't say a statement. It was a Facebook post, a post on his Facebook page and, and put that in there. I think you should all go and read that. It's actually, to be honest with you, this gives me a lot more questions than answers, but apparently they were trying to uh, Anthony Calandro and Carrie Lightfoot were trying to perhaps suggest that that this website would somehow give us answers. Well, the problem is that this website apparently is is listing a lot of information that we have been reporting for a long time since since our inception, since we began. But I, I digress. Uh, on Liptek's statement, a couple of uh, paragraphs that I'll read to you real fast that that are interesting. Quote: Finances look quite good especially given the turmoil in the press. Re really? Sorry. Uh, responsible spending, efficiency, doing things in-house, and accountability are in effect. I've said before that I like what Craig Spray's team is doing with finance, and that continues. Uh, releasable details on litigation processes are, po are now posted on NRALegalFacts.org for anyone who wants to dig in. Do I like brew brewers bills? Nope. But I've received some answers to, to billing review and the value received for that spending. And we will see how that pans out. End quote. So I, I got to tell you, that's kind of concerning to me because of course, this is the leadership telling the board what to think. You know, here's, here's, here's our uh, information. Here's the value. This this is it's almost like a used car salesman, I, I think, at least within the context of this and what I've seen with, with the board of directors, that these directors are being 
given this information, of course, it's privileged information. It's private information. We can't go and see it, but somehow Dwayne Leptek is feeling good about it, which is, it's interesting. Now, continuing on this next paragraph, there have been some encouraging developments on the audit and compliance front that I really wish I could share. This will address many of my concerns about past practices and answer the compliance questions I want answered. I think that's really great. Continuing on, there is an increased willingness to have dialogue about the other matters that I still would like some answers or explanations for. And I'll be taking up the leadership on offers to talk directly about those issues. Asking questions doesn't make someone an enemy. And that has been acknowledged, end quote. Dwayne, that, that last part, absolutely it makes me happy, man. I, I hope that's absolutely the case. But now I have a lot of opinions. I love Dwayne Liptick. I really do. I have a lot of faith in him, perhaps too much faith. I don't know. Anthony, what are your thoughts on all of that? Um, so I like Dwayne Liptick. I, I like him in general. I think he's been mostly pretty upfront um, with with what he's been told. So we're, we're looking in here at that, uh, that paragraph about the finances is finance. Finances look quite good, especially given turmoil in the press, responsible spending, efficiency, doing things in house in house and accountability are in effect. So I believe Dwayne, when he says those things, because that's what he's been told. I, I, I believe that to be true. I don't think he's sitting here. I don't think he's sitting here lying to us. I don't think he's coming up with BS about it, but I, also don't think he's been shown very much. I think maybe there's, um, he's been shown a couple of things have been changed on responsible spending, doing things in house. Um, the in house thing could have been what we were talking about earlier with doing the videos in house. Um, a couple of things may have been changed and he's, he's talking about that here. I don't think, I, I, I don't think there's massive, any sort of massive changes or anything. Now he says finances look quite good which I, I think is interesting because we've heard people getting laid off for not having enough funding. We know that's happening. We know it's happening. So I don't, I don't understand how finances can look good when people are getting laid off for not having enough funding. Can you please explain that to me? Because I don't get it. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe they didn't get laid off and everybody that's told me that is lied, but it's been more than a couple of people. So <clears throat> yeah, uh, releasable details on litigation progress post on nralegalfacts.org. Okay, so I checked out that website. There's nothing really new there. Um, it, it is nice to see all of the legal, um, all the filings and stuff all in one place, which is interesting and it's good. Um, although we had already kind of collected all that stuff, I think, on our reform page. But uh, I encourage you all to check that out. Uh, check out that website. Nothing new is posted there. And the only side of the story you see is the leadership old guard side. There's no um, arguments presented. There's no fact um, FAQ saying, well, you know, one of the arguments against this is this, and here's our retort for it, right? There's no, um, there's no dialogue going on on this side at all. It's all just, hey, here's, here's the old guard's explanation for things. It's nothing we haven't heard before. Uh, he says, do I like the Brewer bills? No, but I've, spent, I've received some answers to billing review and value received for the spend. You know, un until they release that information to the members, I'm just going to go ahead and stick with a hundred thousand dollars a day is being way too much. And they're the, yeah, that's, that's really all I've got. Um, I think that's ridiculous. Uh, and we can look through here a little bit more. Um, he says there's been encouraging developments on the audits and, and compliance front that I really wish I could share. You know, that's fantastic. Um, this, this paragraph leads a lot. It's like, Hey, I'm happy. But, um, until these things can be shared, and told to the members until you come out to the members and say, Hey, here's what's going on. Here's the documents that support it. I don't believe it. I don't until there's proof. I don't believe it. Um, he says there's been encouraging developments. And again, I don't think Dwayne Liptak is lying here. I think he's been repeating what he's been told. And I, th I think he believes it. I, I think Dwayne is being completely truthful here, but I think he's been lied to, or at least not been told the truth. 
um, if that makes sense. And until they prove that audit, comp, uh, that, that there's things going forward with, it doesn't say independent audit, it just says audit. I don't know what that means. Um, I, I wanna see an independent audit. Um, until more of this comes out, it's actually explained to the membership, Everything that he has written here, like it looks good, it makes me feel more hopeful about the situation, but I don't believe it. So, there you go. Something uh, to also consider here. I, I, I totally, like I said, I, I believe Dwayne Liptek is an excellent leader. Uh, it was so cool of him to sit down with, with us. And of course, he, him and Mark Geist, both prior service Marines, they're freaking awesome. They really are. Magpul actual, come on, you know, it's, it was so cool. I'm, I'm a bit of a fanboy, and, and, you know, I very much enjoyed hanging out with them. I am curious to see to what extent Dwayne Levitek could try to find answers for himself. One answer that, yeah. uh, I'm sure that, that he, uh, would probably be conflicted on. And a question that I asked Todd Ravner uh, Rather and I were going back, having a, a debate, a civil debate, a very, very, in fact, it was kind of, kind of nice just to be able to shake his hand and, and talk with him and whatnot. Uh, but you know, we, we were going back and forth debating points and I said, well, okay, let's talk about Josh Powell. Is Josh Powell still employed? He is. Does Josh Powell have allegations of sexual harassment against him? Had yes. One was settled and yet he still works for the NRA. He is a, he is a walking dumpster fire of a liability inside the NRA. I mean, honest to God, for example, I'm, I, of course, I'm not a lawyer and I am speculating a bit, but if Josh Powell has another allegation of sexual harassment, guess who is liable? It's not only Josh Powell. It is the NRA for failing to do anything about a known person who has been sexually harassing others in their organization. Now, apparently there's some, some, stuff going on there. I don't know the details. We don't know the details. I'm, I don't know if, <laughs> I, well, actually, it, no, Dwayne Leptek says he doesn't know. He's, he's received some answers. He hasn't received them all. He, it, unfortunately, Dwayne Leptek does not have all the answers. Who has the answers? We ha we're talking about the board of directors that oversees the future of the NRA. Who, who has answers? Are they being hoarded? Does, does one person have them? Are they in a cookie jar somewhere? <laughs> uh, Andy, what do you think? Mr. Lander, uh, what do you think about that? Well, one of the things I noticed about Josh Powell the entire weekend is nobody was talking to him. I mean, the, the first day he was always alone during the board meeting. He was sitting in the corner behind us. You know, there was probably 16 empty chairs around him. Uh, so I think he is he's kind of like kryptonite right now where no one wants to be actually involved with him. You know, I don't know, I don't have access to the NRA's playbook. Uh, I never did. But um, I, I think there's there's two things to look at. Uh, one, New York and the NRA lawsuit is still going on. So I think possibly a concern is that if they get rid of Powell and, they and you know, they get rid of him, is Powell going to flip to the other side? I think that's a real concern. Uh, in fact, I had a pretty good conversation with uh, Colonel Brown uh, uh, Robert Brown from uh, Soldier Fortune Magazine during the meetings out outside when, when you guys were, were inside, and obviously he is not a he he's a known quantity. He is not liked uh, by some, and um, uh, I think uh, I think probably the NRA is waiting till the, after this New York thing to uh, to make sure that that everything goes the way they want it before they get rid of him. But honestly, I don't see how he can have any sort of um, any sort of title there after after that meeting. I think right now, again, I think they're just holding on to him until after the New York thing, until they can settle it, because I think that they would be worried that he has some information that possibly could be very damaging if uh, they got rid of him. Um, so that's my opinion. I mean, I, I like I, I told uh, I told told some board members, I said, you know, I had friends at NRA that left NRA that were afraid that they would you know, see Mr. Powell in the hallways and they were afraid of what they were going to do, you know, um, and they, le they left because they, they just could not stand the guy. I mean, I had interaction with Powell 
uh, Powell was always, um, to me, a snake oil salesman. Um, he, uh, he, he really, he, he's not somebody you need leading an organization. And, and, and also from, and this was reiterated by some of the board members. They said, you know, when Powell came in, they thought that he was going to replace Wayne LaPierre. And I said, well, we thought the same thing. You know, we always thought before that, that Chris Cox was going to replace Wayne LaPierre. Well, when, when, when Josh Powell came in, it was a, we think Josh Powell's going to replace Wayne. And, and I told one of the board members that I said, I remember when he took over for Chris Kyle as general operations, it was very odd the way it happened because, you know, he called a meeting for all the divisions and we walked down and it was very tight, did very secure. And, you know, I remember looking at my coworkers going, you know, we're supposed to be a, an open organization. The silos are supposed to be down, you know, as, as Wayne says, and we walked in there, very tight security. And uh, Josh Powell said basically three things. He said, my name's Josh Powell. I'm the new head of GO. I'm in charge. I speak for Wayne. Um, I remember I turned to one of the people that I worked with and I said, have you ever seen a hostile takeover? And they said, nope. And I said, well, you just did. Uh, And and my father was a smart man. And he said, anybody that ever said I speak for so-and-so, watch him. So that was before all this stuff happened. And and Josh Powell is just, he's a cancer. He's an absolute cancer. I don't know how they deal with them. I mean, I think right now the strategy, and if it, like, again, if I had access to the playbook, I, I honestly think the strategy is that uh, they are literally just letting him stay there until all this goes away because they're worried about him flipping. Hey, by the way, Andy, uh, just a quick correction for you. I believe you were talking about uh, Kyle Weaver, not Chris Kyle. Uh, I mean, Chris Kyle, you know, Mr. Sniper guy. Did I say Chris Kyle? <laughs> yeah. I meant Kyle Weaver, the former. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of a difference. <laughs> Slightly. <laughs> I don't know. Be watching, you know. So. Oh, my goodness. So, so gents, uh, we had a ton of interactions and observations. And I, I, dro- <laughs> or I flew home last night. The, the meeting adjourned early, by the way. The meeting adjourned at 1.52 p.m. Okay, it was kind of weird. We got back into the, the meeting. Uh, you know, they they talked about our policy and a couple other little things. Uh, Jim Porter had some sort of uh, eloquent speech, I guess. You know that that he wanted to to mention, and they they also mentioned a few folks that had been deceased. Uh, you know, since the last meeting, and then of course, gavel one fifty two meeting adjourned. I got back home. After flying back from Dulles to, to Denver and driving back to my house uh, about you know five hours plus en route, I was thinking about all of this, man. And I'm I'm still I think it's still gonna take me a while to process everything that happened and everything that didn't happen. But still, the question remains, where do we go from here? Uh yeah, where do we go from here, Mr. Anthony? So from here we have two events coming up and our timeline is really going to be defined by those two events. Uh, January 8th through 11th, we have the next board meeting. It's going to be, there it is right there on the screen. That's going to be in Tyson's place, Virginia. Um, Also comes up as McLean, Virginia and some, uh, some maps, but nonetheless, that will be the next board meeting. That is our next, uh, our next opportunity to influence in person, just like you guys tried to do here this weekend. Now, um, I'm pretty. I, I, we'll see what happens between now and then, um, as far as uh, what exactly we can do. But that's going to be the next big thing. What we need is for people to show up again. I know it's across the country, so people that have to fly, people that have to work, it's hard to get there. I get it. But we've got members that are in Virginia. There's one of those th- events takes place on Saturday. That's the actual board meeting. It's a weekend. Maybe you can take Friday off, come down. We've got to pull together, okay? Hey, I, you know, this is one thing that the anti-gunners can always beat us on, it seems. When it comes time for people to show up places, they do it really, really well. A lot of them get out, and they get on the streets. They show up. They do rallies, all sorts of stuff. We need to have the same effect. Not just as in pro pro gun stuff um, in general, but specifically here, we need to make the time. We need to take a day off work. 
We need to do whatever we need to do. We need to travel six hours, whatever it takes and get it done. Because if we don't, if we don't show up, if we don't stand up, if we don't tell them what we need to tell them, if we don't make our, our presence known, then nothing's going to happen. Um, and that is our next, um, that is our next opportunity coming up in early January. And of course, after that, um, the annual meeting, um, but that we'll talk more about that as we get closer to it for right now, as we come up to the next board meeting, um, we as an organization need to talk a little bit, see what our next steps are going to be coming up to that. Rest assured, we will have more steps coming up to that. There will be more awesome things going on, more ways for you guys to have an effect and an impact. But for right now, just be keeping in mind those dates. Try to figure out instead of instead of finding the reasons why you can't get there, try to find ways that you can get there. Instead of saying, oh, I've got to work Friday, say, I wonder if I can get that Friday off. And we got to make it happen. So that's what I got for right now there, Ron. Thank you. Just on a side note, McLean, Virginia, Tyson's Corner is uh, is very accessible. It's within about 20 minutes of three major airports. Uh, well, 20, 30 minutes between Baltimore, Washington International. They have some really cheap flights in BWI. Uh, Reagan's right there, uh, Dulles Airport. And I believe the Metro Station connects and will drive you right into the Tyson. So it's, it's not really – it wouldn't cost a lot of people a lot of money to get there. I mean, yeah, you'd have to find a hotel, but you can even find someplace a little bit farther outside and still still jump in and, uh, and catch a Metro ride to, to that hotel. It's a nice area too, so I just – tell people if they're kind of worried about cost and such that, that it, 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 it's not super expensive and it can be done on a fairly cheap amount of money. So Jeff Knox joined us in the chat and says that November 2nd, second amendment rally is being held at the Capitol grounds in DC. That's pretty huge. Uh, now, granted, I, I've, I've only recently heard of, of this, but November 2nd, there's a Second Amendment rally on the Capitol grounds of D.C. Yeah, you guys definitely check that out. That, that'll be very interesting. But still, as far as the NRA is concerned, I'm not sure if the NRA will participate in this. I kind of doubt it. Uh, but as far as affecting positive change in our National Rifle Association of America, again, that's going to be the next board meeting in January 8th through the 11th. Uh, and of course, you can always contact your board of directors, uh, but Mr. Rob Pincus, would you please give your thoughts on where do we go from here and the upcoming board meeting and, and so on? I think that, uh, well, first of all, Jeff, I uh, appreciate Jeff letting everybody know about the uh, rally for our rights. I do think that's going to be an important next uh, big event. Now, I'll be speaking at Gun Rights Policy Conference next week in uh, Arizona. And when I speak there, I'm going to be addressing some of the issues uh, surrounding the, the crisis inside of the National Rifle Association. I'm going to share some thoughts there, but I'll kind of give everybody a preview right now in terms of what we need to be doing. First of all, it's, it's some of the things that you and Andy and Anthony have already said. Absolutely. I can promise you that I saw the presence. I've, I've, like I said, I've known some of these people for a couple of decades. I saw what it meant to have regular members and not just me, you know, not just other members of the board here of STS because you know we're seen as having this agenda or whatever, but the average members, if you show up in Tyson's Corner, if you show up in January, whether it's for the committee meetings or the main board meeting, walk up to a board of directors, shake their hand and tell them why you're there, that will have impact. Even if it's somebody you already know disagrees with you, somebody that's in lockstep with uh, the, the party line as it were, Go say hi to them, introduce yourself, be polite, but be assertive and let them know why you're there. It's going to make a difference. In the meantime, you can let them know how you feel about the way members were treated and not welcomed at the most recent board meeting through the 76 and 76 campaign. Ron, you did a great job making sure we got out the best contact information available. So reach out to the directors, let them know what you think and let them know that you intend to be there in January. Uh, the other thing I mean, going along with that rally for the rights uh, event November 2nd, is support your state organizations. Because I promise you right now, after the experience that we just had, I do not have faith in the NRA to be the steward of the mantle of responsibility or the people that are holding our funds for the right to keep and bear arms. After this weekend, I just simply don't. Uh, there was too much lockstep. There was too much sycophancy to Wayne LaPierre. There was too much apology to, well, now is not the right time. Even for the, a lot of the directors that said they knew that he needed to go, they were afraid to say he needed to go now defund the NRA. 
Don't spend money at the Friends of the NRA banquets. Don't spend your money for the annual membership. Don't kick in extra money. Don't get that benefactor membership if you're a life member. Um, you know, we've talked before about the, all of the avenues. Everything under the umbrella of the NRA right now is tainted. Uh, there is a there is a cancer inside of the NRA. There are there is a crisis there, and we need to be supporting the other organizations. I'm not going to list them. It doesn't matter what they are. You know who they are out there doing good work. Support your state level organizations. Support the other national organizations, and let the NRA know why you're taking your dollars elsewhere. Because that's one of the biggest influences you can have. Much bigger than a vote, obviously. Much bigger than a petition drive, obviously. Much bigger than even being a voting member at the board meetings trying to be heard and trying to have some influence. So just take your dollars elsewhere and make sure you let the NRA and other NRA members or potential donors and those companies that support the NRA talk to them too. Absolutely agree with you, Rob. Uh, you know, I, I've said it before, you can't be accountable by being unaccountable. And until there is true accountability and responsibility within the NRA, uh, yeah, I Absolutely agree. We definitely have to contact our directors. Keep contacting. It can't be just a one-time thing. In fact, I, I hope that I'm able to sit down with Todd Rathner again and Anthony Calandro and Dwayne Liptek and, and Mark Geist. Mark, good God almighty, you live right up the road from me. I, I hope I see you on the range. It'll be even better. Uh, but regardless, folks, please, if you are an NRA member especially, please be active and involved in your NRA. And that'll wrap it up, folks. Thank you very much for listening. You can follow this, or follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. Our podcast can be found on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Stitcher, and more. Of course, our website, SaveThe2A.org, is where you can find more information about us in particular. All of us at Save the Second are volunteers. I absolutely volunteer. Uh, went out to to DC. You know. Really courtesy of Andy. By the way, Andy, thank you so much for letting me clash, crash at your house. That was very, very courteous and giving me a ride to the airport. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, you know, thankfully, it, thanks so much to you. Folks, we're volunteers. We're happy to, to help try to rally members to make a stronger, more effective, more relevant, and especially accountable NRA. Thank you so much. And for those of you who have sought or thought to donate to Save the Second, Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, that's It's just amazing. It's a humbling. And this has been one heck of a weekend. I hope this uh, podcast has been enjoyable for you all and for from all of us here at Save the Second. Thank you and con contact your board of directors. Oh, I'm getting tongue-tied. Thanks again, folks. See you later. <laughs>